So we're going to be starting off with learning about what's called the refractive index of different materials. Refractive indices are a way of measuring how much light refracts when it enters a new material. If we have two materials with different refractive indices, then that means that the light will bend as it passes from one medium into the other. Just as light is bending as it passes out of the water and glass in this photograph into the air that we're viewing it from. Now the refractive index of material is a measure of how much it bends light. If there's a large difference in refractive index, then the light will be bent a lot. If there's only a very small difference in refractive index, then the light won't bend very much. It turns out that this is also a measure of how fast light is traveling inside the material. So if something has very large refractive index, then it means that it slows light down. So the refractive index of a material, you can calculate by looking at how the angle of a beam of light changes as it enters the material. It can also be measured by figuring out how fast light travels through that material, if you have some way of figuring out how to measure that. Now, the angle of incidence is something that we use with reflection as well. It's the angle between the normal to the surface and the incoming ray. When we're talking about refraction, we represent this by I. So if we're talking about reflection, then the angle of reflection will be equal to I, because the angle of reflection must equal the angle of incidence. But it's not quite the same for refraction. So we're going to have to use a different letter, in this case R, to measure the angle of refraction. And in this case, that'll still be the angle between the refracted ray and the normal. So if here's the boundary that we're passing between, then the normal is the 90 degree line uh, that goes perpendicular to the surface. And if the incident ray it comes in here, then this is the angle called I. It's not the angle between the incident ray and the boundary. And this angle is R. That is the angle between the refracted ray and the normal, not the refracted ray and the boundary. So the relation between the angle which the light goes through and the speed at which it's traveling is given by this equation here. The sine of the incident angle over the sine of the refracted angle is going to be V1, that is the speed of light in the first material where the incident ray is, over V2, the speed of light in the second material that the ray is passing into. So using this, we can figure out exactly how fast light travels inside different materials based on the angles that it forms when it refracts, which can be measured with a protractor like in this photograph. One useful way that we can talk about how fast light travels is by assigning what we call a refractive index to a material. We usually refer to it with the letter N. And so if we're talking about two different materials, material one and material two, then we'll call these variables something like N1 and N2 for the two different materials. These refractive indices are related to the speed of light in the object and therefore related to the angle at which light refracts. So what we do is we say that the speed of light in a material is the speed of light in a vacuum divided by that material's refractive index. So the speed of light in material one, that is V1, will equal the speed of light in a vacuum, C, over the material's refractive index. And so in material two, the speed of light in material two, that's V2, will be the speed of light in a vacuum over the refractive index of material two. If we relate these together, then we get the equation seen at the bottom here. V1 over V2 equals N2 over N1. And we also know that V1 over V2 equals the sine of the incident angle over the sine of the refracted angle. This is a lot of equations to take in, but as soon as you can see these initial relations, it's really not too hard. This relation between the refractive indices of the two materials and their, the speed of light in those materials and the angles of refraction is called Snell's law. So if you're ever used to apply Snell's law to solve a problem, this is the one that you'll be using. It's very handy when we're trying to measure or predict angles of refraction, or if we're trying to determine the refractive index of a material by measuring the speed of light through it or the angle of refraction. 
Now, N's refractive index is very, very close to 1. The only material with a refractive index of exactly 1 is a vacuum in which there are no particles. But in air, we get a number pretty close to 1. Now, in this photograph over here, we've got a pencil and it's passing through both air and water. So what do you think the refractive index for water will be? Will it be less than or greater than 1? Well, we know that the speed of light in a vacuum is the fastest that light can go. And if we use this equation, V1 equals C over N1, it means that if the speed of light in a material is going to be smaller than the speed of light in a vacuum, then the refractive index will need to be greater than 1. In fact, for water, the refractive index is about 1.3. So we can see that these refractive indices are different and light will bend as it passes from one into the other. What's the angle of refraction? Well, we know from Snell's law that the refractive indices and the angles of incidence and refraction are linked by this equation. You can remember that from the last page. So now we can substitute in our values for n1 and n2 to figure out the relation between the incident angle and the refracted angle. Rearranging so that the refracted angle is the subject of the equation. We have the refracted angle equal to the inverse sine of n1 over n2 from here times the sine of the incident angle. So at first this looks quite complicated, but as you can see, it's fairly straightforward following on from Snell's law. Now, different substances, of course, have different refractive indices. We can see just from water and air, that there's a difference between 1 and 1.33. Other substances can have even higher refractive indices than water. In general, light travels slower through more dense substances. That means that if we have a transparent solid, it will tend to be more dense than a transparent liquid. So light will travel more slowly through the solid than it would through the liquid. In a gas, of course, light travels even faster. And in a vacuum, it travels fastest of all. So denser substances, especially solids, have larger refractive indices than other substances. This is because large refractive index means that light travels very slowly, and a very low refractive index, the lowest being 1, means that light travels at its maximum speed. So here we have a table of some different refractive indices. Starting at the top, we have air. Other gases, like pure hydrogen and helium, also have refractive indices very close to 1. Going down, we have some liquids, ice, water, and ethanol. Well, technically ice isn't a liquid, but it's got less density than water, which is why it floats on top of water. So looking at these, we have numbers of about 1.3, or in ethanol, almost 1.4. Going into even more dense substances, we have things like glass and fused quartz, as well as perspex, or plexiglass. So these have a refractive index of around 1.5. That means that if you were to figure out the speed of light in these substances, you would take the speed of light in a vacuum, and divide it by 1.5. Going right down to the bottom, we start to get to the gemstones, and these have a refractive index of even more than 2. That means that light through these substances passes less than half as quickly as it does in a vacuum. Most gemstones, of course, are going to be transparent solids, and so they tend to have quite high refractive indices.